Become a sustaining member of the Commonwealth Club for just $10 a month. Join today. Good afternoon. Welcome to the Commonwealth Club of California. I'm Celia Menchel, chair of the club's member-led Middle East Forum, one of many member-led forums at the Commonwealth Club. The Middle East Forum coordinated today's program. I'd like to thank Malak Jamal. I'm going to read the names, I'm sorry. Uh, Spencer, Justin, who are our AV folks, uh, Mark Kirchner, who's the AV director, John Zipper, another head of the department, and most of all, I'd like to thank my dear friend, Linda Calhoun, for moderating today. Before I turn the program over to Linda, I'd like to show a brief video, which came from the Human Rights <clears throat> Foundation, which I greatly admire. happening all over the world is an issue that concerns every single citizen. Many of the rights we take for granted in the democratic world are a daily struggle for over 4 billion people. No freedom of speech, expression, religion, no rule of law, no free and fair elections, and certainly no separation of powers. Protesters, activists, and journalists often face violence and brutality because of their struggle for freedom. Corruption, tyranny, abuse of power do not go on a break. We believe that the only way to rise against tyranny is through a united global movement. This is precisely what HRF is working to build. By supporting and bringing together activists from all around the world who are standing up to authoritarianism, exposing dictators and their corrupt regime, and creating innovative solutions to strengthen democracy, we will succeed. The most important thing is to be part of a network that empowers you, and the Human Rights Foundation is such a network. Our work has to go beyond simply sharing the message of these activists, dissidents, and journalists. We have microgrant programs that support activists in crisis. In places like Belarus, tens of thousands of Belarusians were put into prison. So we started the Belarus Solidarity Fund. Most of the programs that support activists take them out of their environments and their movements. What the Freedom Fellowship does is supply them with digital security, fundraising, media, nonviolent movement building in a way that doesn't disrupt their work but actually adds to what they are doing. HRF's impact litigation program is able to place the really necessary international legal pressure on these tyrants to facilitate the release and resettlement of political prisoners of conscience. Putin's regime organized horrible repression campaign against activists in Russia. Thanks to Human Rights Foundation, we were able to organize evacuation for dozens of Russian grassroots activists to safe places. I was arrested in Zimbabwe and when the Human Rights Foundation stepped in, they put together a case that could be presented at the United Nations. The United Nations actually issued a statement to the Zimbabwean government to let me go and allow me to enjoy my freedom. It means seeing someone go from solitary confinement one year to speaking on the main stage at the Oslo Freedom Forum the next. A political prisoner's worst nightmare is to be forgotten. Public spotlight, this is the only thing that can work. Only together we are stronger. There are many troublemakers like me, and I feel I am among my family. Human rights activists and, and dissidents, they may often feel alone, and HRF is able to bring them together so that they see that the struggle is often a shared one. It's this extraordinary universal knitting machine that knits us all together. We celebrate powerful stories that spark actions. You play an important role in our democracy movement. We need to assume that the fight for freedom in each one of our countries is the fight for freedom in all of our countries. 
It's only when we choose to do this and put ourselves from empathy into compassion, we will actually be able to move the powers that be to do something similar. Good afternoon, and welcome to today's virtual meeting of the Commonwealth Club of California. I'm Linda Calhoun, chair of the International Relations Forum and founder of CareerGirls.org. I'll be the moderator for today's program entitled The Human Rights Foundation and Justice in Syria. Be sure to join us for the upcoming programs from the club's member-led Middle East Forum, including Biden in the Middle East. Please go online to commonwealthclub.org for more upcoming inf events and information about our member-led forums. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce today's distinguished speakers, Malak Jamal and Roberto Gonzalez. We'll begin with Roberto, who is the Chief Advocacy Officer. Roberto Gonzalez is an attorney admitted to practice in the state of New York. He graduated cum laude from Raphael Landivar University, where he earned a Bachelor of Laws degree. He also holds a master's degree in international law and justice from Fordham University School of Law. As a part of Human Rights Foundation Center for Law and Democracy, Gonzalez's research focuses on comparative constitutional law and international law. Please join me in welcoming Roberto Gonzalez. Thank you again for having us. We are very happy to be part of this panel. I think I, we can start with um, a bit about the history of the Human <laughs> Rights Foundation. Uh, I'm going to give you like a quick summary of, so HRF uh, was founded 15 years ago, uh, 2005, 2006. Um, we so we are headquartered at the Empire State Building. We are now on the 42nd floor, but we began on the eighth floor. It was, I think it was, it was an office, but it was something closer <laughs> to a, a closet. It was a very small space. Um, and over the years, we have been able to grow. Um, we are approximately, I would say, 40 people at HRF, and uh, we are scattered around the East Coast, the West Coast. There's people in uh, Europe uh, and uh, in Asia. So um, we were founded by um, with the moral support of survivors, of freedom champions from uh, different um, tyrannies, from all colors, for example, um, Elie Wiesel, who survived uh, the Nazi Reich, and uh, Václav Havel, who endured you no know, struggles under the Soviet dictatorship. And um, one of the things that makes HRF uh, different from the rest of the human rights organizations is our mission statement. We have, in my opinion, a very special uh, mission statement and a very important one. Um, we, in, in order to allocate our resources, because resources are always scarce, right? If we had all the resources in the world, we could focus on every single country on earth, but we can't. So we try to be as efficient as possible with the resources that we have. So in order to do that, um, we follow a political regime classification uh, conceived by Harvard University professor Stephen Levitsky and Toronto University professor Luke and Wei. A couple of years ago, they published a book called um, The Rise of Competitive Authoritarianism, Hybrid Regimes uh, in the Post-Cold War, if I'm not mistaken. So um, in this book, they classify political regimes in three main categories. On the one hand, there's democracies, democratic system, which we all know and love, right? It's very important. Where there is uh, independence of the judiciary, where there is you know, uh, free and fair elections, periodic free and fair elections, the peaceful transition of power, there is a vibrant civil society, there's independent media, there's people can travel in and out of their countries, et cetera, et cetera. Free speech, obviously, very important freedom of the press. Mm -hmm. 
So we all know about democracies. On the opposite extreme are full-fledged dictatorships, totalitarianisms. The quintessential example of this being um, North Korea, for example, or Eritrea, which is a, like the North Korea of Africa. Under these regimes, there is is a one typically a one party system, right? There is no media at all. The only information is the one provided by the state, by the government. There is no uh, opposition, political parties. There is nothing. There is not the, the judiciary. It's like an like an like another arm of the executive. And in between these two systems, in between democracies and totalitarianism, full-fledged dictatorships, there is something which they, the professors, uh, call competitive authoritarianisms, mm -hmm. which are hybrid regimes, which means that they're not as close as, uh, as a totalitarian state, but they're not democracies. Uh, under these regimes, for example, um, there are elections, but uh, the incumbent uh, messes with the elections, with the electoral process, right? They disqualify opposition uh, politicians. They disqualify candidates. There is independence of the judiciary, but some judges are, you know, friends with the incumbent, right? So they, they, they're not fully independent. There is still independent media, but they are harassed. They, there's lawsuits against them, right? There are, there's fines levied against them in order to make their work more difficult. Right. Uh, there's still stable society, but they are under threat, under harassment, etc. So this long explanation is no, just is give you a hint into how our mission statement is crafted. So we only focus on the latter two uh, type of political regimes. We only focus on competitive authoritarianisms and on fully uh, and on full authoritarianism. And w why is that, right? Um, unlike, for example, like Amnesty International or Human Rights Watch, we, they do great work, uh, but they focus on the whole world. Mm -hmm. We don't. We only focus in non-democracies. And the reason for that is that in democratic systems, in open systems, you are allowed to uh, establish an NGO, you are if you want to defend the right of animals, if you want to defend access to water, if you want to defend uh, women's rights, whatever you want, you know, that the open system allows for everyone to have a voice and to eventually with time to, you know, get to legitimate outcomes. Uh, there's people on the right. There's people on the left. There's news outlets which are uh, could be categorized as more left-leaning or right-leaning, but everyone has a voice, right? There's an independent judiciary. Uh, you can, if you, if, if there's, it's not like there, it's not like bad stuff does not happen in democracies. It's not like police brutality does not exist. It exists, but at least there are prosecutors who will bring the case before a judge, right? They will convene a grand jury. So there's, there's ways, there's avenues to address the issues in society. That those avenues, uh, that escape vault does not exist in mm -hmm. non democracies. So, the voices of the people who would typically complain, who would typically criticize the government, who would typically uh, try to change what's going on in their societies via uh, trying to, 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 have, to run for office, they cannot do it, right? So, they, there's no way for them to change their system. And that's the reason why we focus on those regimes, because we think that's the best way to allocate our resources, to provide a voice to the people who no longer have it or who are increasingly not being able to have a voice in society. Um, so that's the, the uniqueness, I would say, of our mission statement. Um, and uh, based on that mission statement, we have a lot of programs. I'm just going to touch on a couple of them. Because if not, I'm, I, I could take the full hour. Uh, <laughs> uh, so uh, I'm, I'm the chief advocacy officer, and my role it's uh, I, 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 I kind of lead the impact litigation project, which is we try to utilize uh, international uh, mechanisms before judicial and semi-judicial bodies. So at international level. Let's say at the UN level, there's a lot of mechanisms that you can use to try to expose a systemic reality, a systemic violation of some right in a certain country. 
there's uh, you know the UN Human Rights Council. There are special rapporteurs. There are groups of experts like the UN Working Group on Arbitrary Detention. So we try to use all those mechanisms to try to bring light, to bring attention to uh, cases of uh, of activists, of pro democracy activists or dissidents being harassed or put in jail in these countries. Um, we also part of our role is also to educate the, the general public, right? Um, not only about what's going on in democracy, but because of our mission statement, what's going on in places like Venezuela, like North Korea, like Saudi Arabia, Russia, China, right? Um, so we have a program called Celebrities and Dictators. I don't know if, 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 if you know this, but uh, it, it, it's, a, it's a widespread phenomenon uh, that American celebrities go and are paid to sing for dictators. Like, uh, you know, in Azerbaijan, like uh, Uzbekistan, uh, Russia, uh, Chechenia, uh, many American celebrities go there and sing for, you know, the dictator uh, or for their or for their uh, cronies, fundamentally. Uh, and that gives us an avenue. Not only, I mean, they domestically are very involved in in very important social causes. Right. In the U.S. But when they go abroad, they literally like sing for the butcher of that country, for the owner of that state, right, who is tyrannizing their people. So there's obviously a component of hypocrisy in, 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 in that. So we try to call them out. And also by doing that, um, the, the, the public gets to know the reality of a country uh, they don't know much about or they would mm -hmm. never know anything about if not for the celebrity going to that country and singing for the dictator, right? Um, we also have a program called uh, Freedom Fellows in which we take a pool of approximately 10 or 12 uh, prominent uh, pro-democracy activists in these countries, and we bring them to the US or to Europe, and we train them in, uh, in cybersecurity, in uh, mental health, in uh, how to fundraise, which is very important, in this field, as, as you know, uh, to be better activists. I really would like to bring in uh, Malat Jamal, uh, your colleague, who is our second speaker. And um, Jamal, you are the director of policy and research and Malak oversees um, research and analyzes political regime developments in countries under authoritarian rule. So I'm sure your work is actively involved in a lot of the things that Roberto was telling us about. Um, Malak also received her Master's of Arts in Diplomacy and International Relations from Seton Hall University with a specialization in human rights international law, and post-conflict state reconstruction and sustainability. Malak received her Bachelor's of Arts from Fairleigh Dickinson University, where she double majored in sociology and in political science with a concentration in international relations and was awarded the Fairleigh Dickinson Outstanding Achievement in Political Science Award. She completed her minor in Middle East Studies at the American University in Dubai. And Malak's opinions have been featured in Time, The Washington Post, the News Lens and CNN. So please audience, join me in welcoming Malak Jamal. So Malak, um, I'd like you to tell our audience about some of the work that you do. Well, so first of all, um, thank you, Linda, and thank you to the Commonwealth Club um, for hosting us today. Um, it's really a pleasure to be able to speak with you. Um, and so, well, as far as the, you know, to add on to some of what Roberto was saying before about our work at the Human Rights Foundation, um, a lot of our work centers around giving um, a platform to very courageous activists from countries under authoritarian rule that, you know, that work day in and day out to promote and protect human rights um, globally. And we do this through, of course, our programs, but also through um, our annual conference um, 
the Oslo Freedom Forum. Now, um, in addition to that, though, we also uh, on the HRF's um, legal and policy team, you know, this team of, you know, young intellectuals, we also produce um, a wide variety of um, research and reports on some of the most pressing um, human rights issues, which, um, you know, they range from human trafficking to the Mm -hmm. impact of foreign investments on human rights, um, China's strategies of suppression in places like Tibet, Hong Kong, and the Uyghur region. And um, in connection to the subject matter of the conversation, also our we have our recent report on um, framing justice in Syria, the road toward comprehensive justice. And so if I could like speak a little more about that. So this report in particular, it was um, a collaboration between the Human Rights Foundation and the Syria campaign. And broadly speaking, it uh, provides a comprehensive overview of um, both domestic and international um, judicial avenues to prosecute um, the crimes against humanity that have been um, committed in Syria. And so, as Roberto mentioned before, we have a particular mission statement and Syria falls under that mission statement. And the report itself, um, it um, goes into the, this principle of um, universal jurisdiction. Now, um, again, in line with um, our work to give a voice and platform to activists, um, this report we felt was like unique because we also, in addition to conducting our qualitative research, um, we also conducted um, interviews with a dozen um, international legal scholars and um, practitioners, Syrian activists, survivors, and family members of Syrian um, disappeared Syrians, and also tech experts that provided their unique perspective on the systemic abuse of um, that carried out by the Syrian regime and the effects that this has on um, building a case for Syrian justice. And this has gone about by using the Koblenz trial as um, a case study on universal jurisdiction. And um, for our audience who's unfamiliar with, who may be unfamiliar with the principle of universal jurisdiction, this is a process by which um, a state, um, a state's jurisdiction over, um, but can carry out, um, a, or a state can um, have jurisdiction over gross violations of international law, um, such as crimes against humanity, mm-hmm. torture, um, genocide, and war crimes, even if those crimes were committed outside of its border, and neither the victim nor the um, nor the perpetrator of that um, that crime um, are the, even in situation that the victim are not from. The, the state in which the universal jurisdiction trial is taking place. Um, and so this principle enables domestic or national courts to carry out um, cases on um, international um, crimes and in order to hold perpetrators um, accountable for their abuses and to avoid um, impunity. And so one country um, that we focus on and that's been active in um, carrying out international cases is Germany. And so this, the Koblenz trial, um, which is the focus of the report, um, as a result of this, Germany recently was able to convict um, Anwar, uh, two men, um, Anwar R and Iyad A, who were two former um, officials of the Syrian regime's um, security apparatus for um, serious crimes against humanity in Syria. And so for background context, um, Anwar R, he was um, the head of an investigation um, unit in the General Intelligence Al-Khatib branch, or branch um, 251, as it's um, commonly known in Damascus, Syria. And so within this capacity, he oversaw a system of um, detention and torture until he defected and left Syria in 2012. Um, and so when he defected and at one point was in Jordan, he joined the Syrian opposition and his status as a member of this Syrian opposition eventually gave him a pathway to be granted political asylum in um, Germany, where he settled in 2014 with his family. Now, um, Anwar came to the attention of uh, German authorities when he went to the police um, seeking protection because he feared for his life because he might uh, thinking that he might be targeted by the regime for his defection. And in the process of speaking to the police, he gave a detailed account of his role in perpetrating state-sponsored um, torture and sexual violence and killings. And um, eventually this triggered um, 
like this information provided the police with information to trigger an investigation into his case. Um, the other um, individual, um, Iyad R R A, he implicated himself when he was speaking to authorities also, providing a very um, thorough description of his role um, under the Assad regime. He was um, a subordinate of Anwar R. Um, mm -hmm. And his role was arresting and transporting detainees to Branch 251, um, despite being aware that they could be tortured and potentially killed. And although he was not alleged to have participated himself in torturing or beating the detainees, um, what ended up happening was that both men were arrested on February 12, 2019 in Germany and formally indicted in Koblenz on October 22 of, of that year. Um, Anwar R. was charged with um, crimes against humanity for 4,000 um, counts of torture, 58 murders, um, rape and sexual coercion. And Iyad A. was charged with aiding a crime against humanity. And um, their trial started on April 23, 2020. And initially they were to be tried jointly together. And despite the fact that their connection to two Branch 251 was the only clear similarity in their cases. However, ultimately, the judge ordered that their cases be um, separated um, and the, setting a precedent on February 24, 2021, Iyad A was convicted and sentenced to four and a half years in prison. And almost one year later, um, January 13, 2022, Anwar R was sentenced to life in prison for having overseen the deaths of at least 27 people and torture of at least 4,000 at a detention facility in um, Damascus. Now, despite that this was a very historic and groundbreaking um, you know, case, um, its impact is rather limited um, in the sense that crimes in Syria are still ongoing and the Syrian regime is still um, unaffected as it's still carrying out um, abuses. Um, similarly, um, the universal jurisdiction has failed to um, address, redress the abuses um, being um, that have millions of Syrians have, um, you know, millions of Syrians have suffered. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm going to remind our audience because this is this is fascinating and there's there's so many parallels with what's gone on in Syria with what we're witnessing today uh, in Ukraine. It was almost in many ways um, Syria has been was a dress rehearsal for some of the actors in um, Ukraine. But I'd like to remind our audiences that this is a virtual Commonwealth Club program entitled um, the Human Rights Foundation and Justice in Syria. And we're in conversation with um, Malak Jamal and Roberto Gonzalez. So, um, the questions that and for people, you know, if you've got questions who are watching this um, program, please uh, put them in the chat and uh, we'll get to them later in the program. Um, what I'd like to do is, um, you know, talk about Malak, you were talking about the the Syria, the justice in Syria project in the report. And I'm just curious, I mean, you gave us um, an example with the Koblenz uh, trial of how doing the, connecting those dots resulted in um, those convictions. But how generally and, and, and it's amazing that, um, you know, in Germany, they were able to get this these convictions, these trials. How has it been generally received? I mean, are other what's the reaction from other countries in the Middle East, other European countries? Just, you know, because it's it's an amazing thing that you're doing. So I'm just curious. Well, so in general, as far as like the interviews we carried out for the report, like there's there's mixed views. So on the one hand, you know, again, you know, this was a situation where um, it kind of sends a signal that members of the regime, you know, like these are two uh, officials from the regime that were held accountable for their crimes. So this is a step in the right direction. However, um, at the same time, um, you know, there's still as far as, you know, uh, victims, for example, of the the abuses that have been carried out, like 
there's the issue, for example, um, those uh, the report particularly gives attention to um, the topic of enforced disappearance. There are many Syrians whose loved ones, they've been disappeared. They want answers. Um, and so this is something that needs to be addressed. And some, um, for example, some activists, we well, among the recommendations we have in the report is to, you know, support initiatives that um, focus on um, giving light to the issue of enforced disappearance. Um, it's um, ultimately- Tell us about, are there other recommendations that, that came from the report specifically that we should all know um, where? So for example, we, um, among, apart from like activists that we interviewed, um, we also, um, conducted interviews with individuals in like the tech field. And so the tech field, for example, is um, very important in the sense that, you know, when you, a lot of the information on the ground sometimes from the conflict in Syria, it comes about um, through, for example, people post videos online. Um, and it's about um, tech companies have a role in preserving this information because this information can contribute to universal jurisdiction trials and used um, as evidence. Also in our report, and this connects back to um, HRF's um, annual conference, the Oslo Freedom Forum, which um, gives a platform to activists. Um, the media has a role in um, sharing the stories of, um, let's say, victims of the of enforced disappearance and their families. Um, we also um, provide um, recommendations, something that the report goes into is the topic of sexual and gender-based violence. In um, universal jurisdiction cases, there should be attention paid to um, the different impact on men and women, for example, when it comes to this um, topic and uh, recognizing that maybe these trials should be approached through maybe a, a gender you know, sensitive lens. So the report offers um, a wide variety of um, recommendations. Great, thank you. Um, Roberto, I want to uh, bring you back into the conversation and um, I'd like to, I, I, I think you did a great job of helping our audience understand sort of the, the segment <laughs> that you focus on uh, in with authoritarian regimes, but can you help our audience in terms of understanding uh, some of the problems um, in democracies that even though they may not be addressed by the Human Rights Foundation, um, things that uh, they should be watching um, and and mindful of and, um, you know, putting brakes on <laughs> in terms of supporting democracies? Oh, absolutely. So democracies are imperfect, obviously, right? Mm -hmm. Because they are populated by us, by people, <laughs> which are <laughs> deeply imperfect. So the, the, the thing is that as far as, as in human history, we have devised like democracy is just the most efficient, best system, because the alternative is to have just a very small group of people dictating what everyone else should do. But obviously democracies, uh, there's, there are warning signs that we should all be aware of, right? Rhetoric by politicians uh, is important. For example, um, delegitimizing the media is important. Attacking the members of the media is very important. That is a symptom of, of, of having a thin skin, which is which it should, it's, it's not compatible with, with a democratic system, right? Regardless of what the media says about the person in power, their job is to just uh, take it fundamentally. Um, so attacking the media is a very, very concerning sign. Trying to shut down uh, news outlets, it's also very, very concerning through lawsuits, through defamation lawsuits, uh, through by if the government is somehow a pain for advertisement on a certain news outlet, then instantly removing that advertisement from the news outlet or uh, establishing, uh, you know, increasing tax on like paper ink, stuff like that. that that's typical in authoritarian regimes. So that's why I'm, I'm bringing it up. Um, also, well, the, the, the justice system plays such an important uh, part of keeping an open system uh, open. 
the more you politicize uh, the justice system, the, the more concerning it is, right? Because it can become like a, like a team sport. Mm. Um, and obviously the losing end is the party not in power and not having uh, friendly judges on their side. Uh, that's also a concerning sign. Um, roadblocks to the democratic process, to the electoral process are important. Um, the, the freer, the better, the more people that can participate and the easier it is, it is for them to participate, the better, right? Um, democracies are, for example, there's, there's, there are, you know, uh, um, constitutional monarchies like in the UK, there are republics like the US. So not all democracies are the same and some democracies work with different rules and others with, with different mechanisms. Um, but, uh, they're uh, demonizing the opposition. Uh, it's a very important one. Politicians and political parties can have disagreements and deep, deep disagreements, but that shouldn't go to the level of, of, of animosity that unfortunately we're kind of experiencing now in the US, that the, 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 the result of that could be violence, like political violence, and you, you can start like spiraling down that rabbit hole so uh, those are warning signs uh, that, that we should all be mindful of and paying attention to. Um, obviously, yeah. this, despite all the, all the, the imperfections and all the, 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 the concerns that we all have about the United States, in my opinion, and, and is that obviously the U.S. still is a pretty strong democracy. I think that sometimes we, we lose perspective on how institutions still function in the U.S. Uh, because many of us don't have a diff other perspective, right? Other uh, haven't lived in different other countries. Um, so in this field, in my life, myself and my colleagues, we we end up appreciating imperfect democracies, however imperfect they might be, because mm -hmm. we study different realities. And when you compare that to to the democratic world then uh, you end up appreciating uh, a, a you know, strong, robust institution, right? Autonomy, independence, um, and, uh, and yeah, but yeah, but, but listen, um, I think it was Ronald Reagan who said that democracy is always a generation away, away from extinction, right? You cannot, you know, you can, like democracy, you cannot take it for granted, right? Yeah. Something yeah. And, and work towards and, 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 and be part of the, of the political process and be mindful of, right? And teach your kids about. It's not something that it's a given. We were, we were not born with democracy in our, in our bloodstream, right? It's something you need to fight for and defend. Absolutely. And, you know, given the focus of the work of the Human Rights Foundation on um, authoritarian regimes, I think it's it's important. And, I, you know, I, I'll repeat what you were saying in terms of things that for those of us who live in democracies to, to be mindful of, you know, um, attacks on media. Um, do we have, you know, maintaining the independence of the judiciary, um, watching and seeing what goes on with voter suppression um, you know, our opponents demonized. So, you know, these are things that um, I think any responsible, you know, resident in our present day and current democracies, those are just things to, to keep an eye out on. And uh, thank you for sharing that. Um, but now sort of pivoting to um countries that are not <laughs> democracies. Um, can you tell us about your new uh, defunding dictators to project? What is that project? Yeah, I can, I can tell you a bit more uh, <laughs> on that. Huh? Not that I like to talk, but perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a, it, it's a tool fundamentally. It's an online tool. It's uh, it's called defund dictators, as you said, uh, Linda. So it is so it's mostly for passive investors. So the ETFs, which are exchange exchange traded funds, have become quite popular for passive investors. Um, and we in, in, in this tool is a tool for them to understand what's their level of exposure 
when it comes to emerging markets, ETFs. Let me try to unpack that a bit. So <laughs> ETFs are the so ETF, the underlying asset of the of the ETFs are securities, right? So if you are an investor and you have, you know, and you are uh, invested into social causes, you care about democracy, you don't like uh, supporting, you know, dictators abroad, and you want to understand how much of the ETF you're buying will be allocated into a uh, dictatorship, you can just type in the, the ticker, the, the, the name of the ETF, and that tool will tell you what's your exposure level. Uh, Maybe an example will be more illustrative. So um, in places like uh, China, for example, uh, there's literally like zero chance that huge companies are completely independent and have nothing to do with the Communist Party of China. It's like zero chance that that's the case. Um, and there's a lot of collaboration, let's call it, between the Chinese military and some of these companies. So you, as an American, as a responsible American, uh, you don't want to end up propping up the, the Chinese military, right, through your investment. So this tool allows you to understand how much of the securities in that ETF will end up in China. Uh, uh, so... May and perhaps unbeknownst to you, you will be putting money in the bucket of, of, of a CCP official. Um, so we, we're not saying that we're not getting investments. Investments are a wonderful tool. Um, the growth of economies, obviously, China has been able to lift a lot of people out of poverty. But uh, if you like, so this provides you information, this allows you to make an informed decision about whether you want to invest in an ETF that is highly exposed to a market like China or not. So it's, it's fundamentally that. And so tell me again how it works. Is Do you go to a website? Is there, how do you track? So uh, it, our website, it's called uh, defunddictators.org. So okay. there's a box there. You t type in your the ticker, which is kind of like the, the, the right. couple of, you know what ticker is, most of our, your audience know. So you type it in. And then it gives you a result with your level of exposure to that country. Crazy. And I obviously invite everyone here listening to just after this conversation to check out that website. Great. And so it's defundingdictators.org? Exactly. Defunddictators.org. Okay. Great. Thank you. And, you know, um, I wanted to ask you, Jamal, um, I look, you know, we're, we just heard your bio and um, the extraordinary compa capacity that you have to do really probably anything that you put your mind to. Can you tell us why you decided to uh, concentrate your professional work in this area and um, what that experience has been like for you? Well, so, I mean, growing up, I always kind of had this uh you know, I, I grew up with the, like my parents originally are from Lebanon. They grew up, you know, during civil a civil war and they came um, towards the end of the civil war to the the United States um, to start a new life. And so kind of getting at what Roberto was talking about before, when you when you come from that background and you, you come to a country like the United States, you know, you recognize, you know, democracies do have their imperfections, but they're they provide you with opportunities that also you might not be able to have elsewhere. And so I've always had this kind of like international perspective, you know, wanting to promote peace and like human rights. So I kind of I had the, these values like instilled in me and um, eventually just growing up, um, you know, I was always like reading up on the latest international relations because I have Middle Eastern background. I was always also interested in like mi Middle Eastern like geopolitics. Um, and then I remember when I started my undergraduate degree um, in, um, you know, at Fairleigh Dickinson University, I remember there was, you know, this was a time period in which, you know, the Arab Spring was taking place. And um, I took a course, it was called um, Dictators and Democrats. And so I got exposed to a lot of different um, 
democratization, um, like literature, which, you know, interestingly enough, uh, Lubitsky and Way's the book, um, Competitive Authoritarianism, um, kind of was actually a book that I had um, exposure to while I was studying in school. And then eventually I also, um, I pursued my master's degree where I also got to, um, you know, deep dive and specialize more into human rights. And um, after I, I graduated with my master's, Back in way back when, after uh, graduating, I started off as an intern at the Human Rights Foundation, and progressively over the years, I've been able to, you know, work. I I found my work uh, very like rewarding at the Human Rights Foundation because you know I was able to take aspects of like different aspects of my life, my academic um, background, and apply them to um, my work here. And eventually, over time, I became. Um, the director of policy and research. So, you know, everything kind of fell into place. And um, yeah, and the nice thing about the Human Rights Foundation is that many of my colleagues, we have very, um, you know, interesting backgrounds and um, kind of like you were saying, we have like the freedom to pursue different and creative projects as long as they fall in line with our mission statement. And also our dear colleagues also are like, you know, friends and family. So that's also makes the work even more rewarding and meaningful. Yeah. And um, speaking to the capacity of the foundation, how, how many people are you and how did you, uh, so tell me a little bit, you know, about the, more about the organization in terms of um, the the capacity. I know you you work in specific parts of the world. Um, and then I after I hear from you, I guess, uh, Roberto, about sort of um, how you operate overall. I'd like to know from you, Malak, how you how Syria ended up in your portfolio. Well, so um, as far as Syria, again, it like fall, it, it's among the countries that we focus on. And um, through the, the one of the things about the Oslo Freedom Forum that we host is that, you know, it brings together people from a wide variety of different fields, whether it be like the, the um, of course, activists, the, um, journalists, policymakers, people from the tech field. And so. Through the Oslo Freedom Forum, um, you know, I have colleagues that I met from, you know, the Syria campaign, and it really it was just um, a kind of, uh, you know, a conversation about this, uh, an interesting conversation about this trial going on in Koblenz, and then um, we just started having a discussion, and we thought that um, it would be very valuable to have um, a report on this topic, given that um, you know, it's a very unique case, and. Um, the Syria campaign, they have a very um, big network of like activists um, that we were able to interview for the report. So um, I think, um, so yeah, this was an example of um, one of the the impact that the Oslo Freedom Forum has um, in, in the long term. Thank you. And Roberto, tell us more about just uh, the capacity of the organization. So we are, as I, I think I told you at, at the beginning, so we are approximately like, like 40 uh, people at the Human Rights Foundation. Uh, we are lucky in the sense that we have uh, lots of different people with different interesting rich backgrounds, interest in different type of fields. Uh, for example, Malak comes from the poli-sci world, I come from the legal world, as you know, Alex Gladstein, which which spoke here at the Commonwealth Club uh, uh, some time ago. He's an expert when it comes to Bitcoin. So we have a, different people interested in different topics, but everyone with the aim of you know trying to make the world a better, more mm -hmm. prosperous, more free place for everyone else. Um, so one of the interesting things, at least in my experience, has been that we get to wear different hats sometimes. So. I like to do legal stuff. I like to file petitions. I like to write things. But for example, um, that is not enough sometimes, right? So we need to advocate on behalf of a dissident. So perhaps we need to write an op-ed uh, and place it on a news outlet, right? So that's a di completely different product that I, uh, until recently, I couldn't dominate, right? So you need to learn how to do different stuff. For example, we are asked to provide opinions and then you need to go to the TV or radio. And then it's something you are not used to, but you learn how to do it as part of your, your toolbox 
of right to 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 uh, advocate on behalf of people. Um, uh, also, it, this this line of work gives us the, it, it's it's a privilege to be in touch with what we consider you know freedom champions, right? These activists, these dissidents who have all the incentives in the world to not do what they do. Like who on their right mind would, you know, be an activist in Cuba, for example. So they are harassed, they are put in jail, no process, they are, you know, taken out of jail, put back in jail again, or an activist in Russia, for example, like Alexei Navalny. These people risk it all, right? They, they are they get poisoned, like Alexei Navalny got poisoned. A excellent member of our community, uh, Vladimir Karamusa, has been poisoned twice. Uh, it's just a miracle that he's alive, right? Um, so people like that, individuals like that, you know, like the the, the normal incentives uh, of people in that situation will be to, you know, stop what they're doing, just go back home with their family and get a safe job and not get into activism because that's going to lead them to jail or death, literally. Um, so these people are are special, right? They are extraordinary in the sense that they risk it all for a, a cause and for a okay. higher cause, higher than themselves. Um, so that that is wonderful um, to be in touch with them, to help them, to try to help them advance their cause. Um, and many times they are successful, right? Many times we get them out of jail. Many times, as Malak has mentioned, uh, we have this wonderful conference, isn't not because we put it together, but it's honestly what the best human rights conference in the world. And uh, that's a quote from the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, BBC. Oh, let me start for, for our audience. It's the Oslo Freedom Forum. Oslo yes. Freedom Forum. Uh, and when does it happen traditionally? It happens every year in May in Oslo, Norway. And the reason for that, you might your audience might be asking themselves, but why Norway? Huh? Why so mm-hmm. far away? Well, there's the a Nobel Peace Prize. Exactly <laughs> right. So Norway has a long tradition of being a country which gets involved in peace processes around the world. The Nobel Peace Prize is awarded at City Hall. Uh, also, uh, the Nobel Center is there. So um, it, it was like the natural place to where, where to host an event. Uh, we collaborate with the city of Oslo. So we have a, an excellent dynamic with them. So they are very important for the conference. So the beauty about the conference is that we bring activists, technologists, entrepreneurs, members of the media, uh, diplomats, everyone together for a couple of days so they can understand and learn about different realities from places, you know, that 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 they're not part of a news cycle, unfortunately, right? Um, so we connect these activists to technologists, uh, to funders, people who have the capacity to fund their causes, right, Mm -hmm. to members of the media so they can, you know, uh, have a profile of them public somewhere so that elevates their their, their profile and also get more, uh, get, it's a bit more safe for them to operate in the country because that provides a bit of protection, right? Right. So uh, that happens every year. In May, we have a couple of satellite events, like mini Oslo Freedom Forums that happen here in uh, New York. Uh, I think the, the the upcoming Oslo Freedom Forum in New York is going to take place like in October 3rd, just um, for your audience in case they are close by and want to, to attend. New York. Happen to be in New York. And also uh, there's an Oslo Freedom Forum in Taiwan. And uh, we have uh, hosted one in Mexico. Um, but... Um, but 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 yeah. So if anyone is interested, they can they can they can go into OsloFreedomForum.com and all the information and previous talks are there. You know, uh, Roberto, uh, from your comments and Jamal's comments, I mean, you are, are dealing with people who are incredibly brave. I mean, you know, it is courage on steroids in terms of activists that are in these countries where it is they are taking their lives in their hands um, to speak out and, and to take action. And, 
you know, just from the Oslo conference, I mean, there's a lot of places where this is happening. How do you decide where you're going to work? I mean, how do you prioritize? And, um, you know, we, we know you've done this Syria report. I mean, sort of what's next? Where are you focusing? Well, so as far as like the legal and policy team, for example, we have like regional, different regional point people. So essentially like the, each regional point person will, will, um, you know, assess what, you know, what are the most pressing issues in the region? Um, which country um, should they focus their attention on? Um, and oftentimes also sometimes um, like there's certain subject rather than, you know, focusing country by country, we focus on specific, um, you know, topics. Um, so for example, um, like the, the tool that Roberto was speaking about before, like, um, you know, that's an example of looking at, you know, the intersection of like, you know, economics and human rights. That's, um, so that's not specific to a particular country, but it's an important um, subject matter. Um, also, um, we've like human trafficking is another topic that, you know, we've come to find it's important to highlight. And we found over the years, there is a correlation between human trafficking and um, authoritarianism in the sense that, um, you know, it's something that happens all over the world. However, mm -hmm. we found that under authoritarian regimes, oftentimes um, their efforts that they make to tackle these issues um, is not as strong as those um, being carried out um, by democracies. Um, and then also through through our network of activists, also sometimes they might raise certain issues to our attention. And based on that, we might look into them a little bit more. And um, depending on what the topic is, we may go about campaigns or we might write a report or um, a variety of different, you know, outputs that we can produce. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, so it's it, the the problem in the sector can drive a lot of the decision making in terms of where you will concentrate resources and personnel um, to address those issues. And then I just have to say for our audience, you know, we are seeing in real time um, a lot of crimes against humanity and at, at this current moment. And I, I wonder if you can uh, have our audience understand that, um, you know, th there are people like you and your colleagues that will, you know, follow the, the trail and help bend that moral arc of the universe towards justice. And so as you think about what's happening in our world now, I mean, what kinds of things do you think would be prescriptive for all that we're seeing? Uh, I know you're not working uh, in those areas per se, but just generally, so our audience can know, well, there's things that can be done. We're not helpless. I think that's an excellent question. I think the most important thing in, in my perspective, I don't know in, in Mark's perspective, but it's being informed. Try to understand the realities of other places, right? Try to understand what they're going through and 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 be empathetic, right, with with their realities. Sometimes it's easy to brush off, you know, the suffering of other people because it's not happening in your neighborhood, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I think that their path towards freedom uh, it's kind of intertwined. With with our way of life, with our with our with our the liberties that we have, right? Uh, I think we all want to work towards a freer world. Um, I think there's a lot to do. To start with, read, right? Be informed. Yeah. Second, I would say get involved. You can get, uh, not necessarily with HRF, but you can get involved with HRF or with any other international human rights organization that might be working towards helping these people. There's a ton of them, the International Red Cross. There's, right, if you want to donate your time and effort to try to send food to people in Ukraine, there is a lot of that, a lot of, of, of what you can do. Also, I would recommend get in touch with your representative, right? Um, there's a lot of efforts being, uh, being um, uh, put forth in, in Congress, like 
um, sanctions, you know, new legislation on sanctions, on who can come to the U.S., on who can use the U.S. financial system. Uh, the same is happening in Canada and the U.K. and, and Australia. So um, uh, legislative action is also important. But for that to take place, people need to, you know, reach out to their representative, right, to push for that make clear that that is something they care about, right? They don't want these bad actors coming into their country, fighting to their neighborhoods and buying penthouses on Fifth Avenue, which unfortunately there's a lot of those guys. Um, London, unfortunately, has a, a big issue with that. There's a lot of corrupt, bad actors, uh, you know, with lots of properties in London. So, and, and there's something we can do about it, but people need to be a bit more informed, a bit more engaged. And uh, if we all chime in, I think we can, you know, as you said, bend that arc towards, you know, justice. Well, that's all that we have time for today. Um, I'd like to thank you, uh, Malak Jamal and Roberto Gonzalez, um, for their comments uh, in today's program, the Human Rights Foundation and Justice in Syria. I'm your I'm Linda Calhoun, and I've been the program moderator. And now this virtual meeting of the Commonwealth Club of California, celebrating 119 years of enlightened discussion is adjourned. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you.